Right on. I'm a recovered alcoholic. My name's Tony. Welcome, everybody. Thursday night Big Book Study Workshop of the Program of Recovery. We started the meeting. Now maybe you can finish what you're saying later, or we could wait, but well, we're not going to wait, so we're going to keep going. Tony, you got to unmute. I got to unmute. I'm unmuted. So welcome to Thursday night Big Book Study Workshop. We do the, the Zoom online, and we also do it in person. How we open this meeting is with the serenity prayer, and uh, what do we need for a good meeting? God. God. Grant me serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Well, I'm glad Joanne didn't make too many people upset last week. You all back this week. You know, that's, that's getting there's, better. There's always tonight. There's, there's always, always tonight. tonight. So we're just starting from the beginning. For those who are looking for a new experience or those that are new to this thing, this is the real game changer, right? If you're looking for an actual different experience in your life, this is the basis of what Alcoholics Anonymous is, is built on. So we did the introduction last week, and, and if you missed last week and you want, you could go online to, to where the talks are and you can find out last week's and this week's will be there. We're going to continue to roll right through these. We have the worksheets up there. If you need a book, it's up there also. So last week we did the introduction. We got a kind of like the basis to this thing of, of what type of book is this? What type of book is it? Okay. There we go. We got two, how many people are here right now? That's not bad. Eh? 30 people, three people put up their hand. That's not bad. <laughs> how many people are still thinking? Yeah, everybody's hand going up. So we found out at the title page, right, the story of how many thousand men and women who have recovered from alcoholism. We looked at the point of the story is what makes this thing so remarkable, right? Then we've seen how many people put this together, how many people's collective experience is this based on? Over 100 men and women, right? And so what happens is when your ideas start being grounded on, in something other than yourself, it, it, it kind of it, it becomes way more beneficial, right? Because how many people sat in a meeting and tried to figure it out? You thought you had it going on until they give you another 24-hour chip, right? <laughs> I don't know why it didn't work, because <laughs> you were working your program. <laughs> That's why it didn't work, right? So, so then they talked about a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body, and how were they going to show us how they recovered? Precisely. They're going to show us how they did it. They're not going to tell us how to do it. Big difference in conversation, right? When somebody says, here, let me show you, right? It's a lot different conversation than somebody telling you something. Anybody ever been trying to tell something here, told something? Mm -hmm. Let me tell you one more time. You got to do that. It doesn't work to what the showing part, right? So when they talk about a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body, when you just open this up, do you know what they're talking about? So what would be a good reference to kind of start that conversation of what they mean by a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body? Who would, who would be a good person to make reference to? Say it out loud. Be proud like you've been here before. <laughs> and the first, the first couple months you did this, you said all the wrong answers. Now you got the right answers. You might as well say it out loud, right? Times in a row and you got to figure it out sometimes. That's it. So be proud now. It's like, <laughs> finally. <laughs> it's the doctor's opinion, 100%. And so one of the best parts I, I find is, is the actual opening page to the doctor's opinion. It starts the whole, the whole kind of basis to this whole thing and the witnessing by professional people. And it kind of sets up the idea of where we get our basic information from in regards to the first symptom in alcoholism. What's the first symptom in alcoholism? Hmm? Well, but they call this specific. What do they call it? The allergy, right? Why do we need to call it the allergy? They call it the allergy because then they use different terminology to explain the allergy, right? Because if you didn't know the allergy and you talked about the other stuff, it wouldn't make as much sense as understanding that we have an abnormal reaction to compared to normal people. We kind of covered that. We used exa examples like uh, our friend here. We, we, she's here as an example for most of the stuff we talk about here. So. <laughs> Once again, this here's another example of what the doctor's talking about. <laughs> so so and part, of, part of the opening to this thing, he, he talked about these certain types of people that were beyond his ability and scope to help, right? 
and he gave a, a case that of, of a person who went through his facility for the third time. What was the difference the third time compared to the first two times? He acquired certain ideas that he put into practice, yes? And the, doc the doctor kind of witnessed this thing, right? So as they started to go through here, one of the interesting things we're gonna, we covered in great detail, but they talk about the human condition and, and why these people keep on returning back to drink again. They talk about men and women drink essentially. Do you want to take it from there? Men and women drink essentially because they like the effect produced by alcohol. The sensation is so elusive that while they admit it is injurious, they cannot, after a time, differentiate the true from the false. So th that's, that's interesting, the truth from the false, right? You kind of underline that. Where, where are we again, sir? In the doctor's opinion on page 24. Doctor's opinion 24. We covered this last week, right? They cannot tell the, the truth from the false. Then they go into talking about this condition that happens in the mind. We covered that kind of in great detail, right? Every, everybody just kind of relax for a minute. We're just reviewing last week, and we'll, we'll get into the, into the material for this week in a few minutes here. So when they talk about the truth from the false, and then he goes and talks about the inability to see the truth in what, right, where they see others drinking with impunity. What does that mean? Without consequence. How many people, if you could drink without consequence, would be here tonight? Nope. Nobody would be here because we have a consequence problem. We don't have a drinking problem, right? If I could just stop before the police show up or before I hit on my cousin or before, you know, I, I get in my car and blah, just before the trouble starts. Anybody? Then I wouldn't need to be here, right? So we get here because we think we have a consequence problem, which we do. We have a lot of problems when we get here. Anybody? You sit through the whole meeting. We're trying to tell you about a solution. You're too busy thinking about you and your problems. Mm -hmm. How am I going to fix this? What am I going to say about that? Right. So naturally, when you become sober, anybody become restless, irritable, and discontent here? Because yeah. now you, you have no, no, no solution for you. So is that alcoholism when you're irritable, restless, and discontent? Or is that the human condition that you no longer have a solution for? Right? And so as long as you don't have a, uh, a condition, a uh, solution for your human condition, what inevitably are you going to turn back to? How many people has relapsed here? How many people said never again? Oh, maybe one more time. <laughs> and then after, try to get sober, going to say, now I really mean it. Any really mean it? The last 15 times I was joking, but this time I really mean so, it. So the truth from the false, right? And then the doctor talks about these people keep on what? That's worth reading. Where it says this is repeated? Yeah. Okay. This is repeated over and over. And unless, unless this person can experience an entire psychic change, there is very little hope of his recovery. On the other hand, and strange as this may seem to those who do not understand, once a psychic change has occurred, the very same person who seemed doomed, who had so many problems he despaired of ever solving them, suddenly finds himself easily able to control his desire for alcohol. So, so if you're kind of hypothetically looking at, everybody's heard how it works here, and they talk about our, our lives become unmanageable. What would make these people's lives unmanageable? Their irritable, restless, and discontentment, or their inability to stay sober? Right? Why is your life unmanageable? If I could stay sober, would my life look different than getting loaded all the time? It kind of makes your life a little unmanageable if you can't stay sober, right? Are you very dependable? Do you think you are? I showed up drunk. I showed up. <laughs> I could go home now. Okay. So they talk about that truth from the false, this thing that happens in the mind. It makes them sense for them to take a drink. Drinks, which they see others taking with impunity. Once they take the drink... Right? They say something happens in the mind. They call it a desire. They're going to expand on that later because the important part here is the physical part. Right? The example of the, the allergy, the physical part. That when these people put it into their system, something happens to them. Right? And what that translates to is anybody ever have a drink here? <laughs> right group. Okay, just checking. So once I sat in an essay meeting, they all looked at me weird. Okay, so... That was a different, forget it. We'll leave that one alone. <laughs> Never did get a chip. No, so, so that, 
<laughs> Sorry, I can't help it. It's been a long day. I just came from work, right? It was one hell of a day. Uh, never mind a cake. No, so anyways. Um, so they talk about once this change happens, so if they never put alcohol into their system, would they trigger the phenomenon of craving? So, well, you need to understand the phenomenon of craving, right? Why we can't drink like other people. We think we drink like other people, but we seem to get in more trouble than them. Then when we find out other people don't drink like us, how many people were surprised about that? How many people, let's be honest, for people that you've met that don't know how to drink, did you think they were the ones with the problem? I see people, two or three drinks, I thought, that, now that's a problem drinker. <laughs> My wife's a problem drinker. I don't understand how she drinks. If I could drink the same way my wife did, I'd be I do doing it all, it all day, day long. All day. <laughs> so, so now they're going to give an example of what they're talking about. So as we go into Bill's book. Oh. I just want to back up in the book okay. what Tony is saying on page 26, because we didn't get a chance to get there last week. And it's a good principle to leave off of, in the doctor's opinion, before you go into Bill's story, Right. We've just inundated you with a bunch of information. We spent a whole hour going through that information last week. So it's good to come week to week, right? So that we pick up where we left off. But to summarize what Tony was just talking about, it says here on page 26, just towards the bottom, all these, and they're referring to a couple of paragraphs prior to this paragraph where they talk about different types of people, right? Different types of people with a drinking problem, not different types of drinkers necessarily. But they say all these and many others have one symptom in common. They cannot start drinking without developing the phenomenon of craving. That's what we've been talking about, right? This is the common denominator, right? Once, we, once these people put alcohol inside their body, what, ha- what happens? It triggers the, the allergy, right? The phenomenon of craving develops, and it's anybody's guess when it will end. But what we know it will end with is consequences. Because if anybody drank this much, what would they have? consequences, right? This phenomenon, as we have suggested, may be the manifestation of an allergy, which differentiates these people and sets them apart as a distinct entity. That's the common denominator. What's the distinct, uh, the first distinct entity of an alcoholic? The allergy. So if you can have two or three drinks and decide to go to bed, and you can do that each time you drink, are you alcoholic? No, this is the distinct entity which sets these people apart from normal drinkers, right? It has never been by any treatment with which we are familiar permanently eradicated. What he's saying here is that there's no treatment, right, that you can administer to an alcoholic that will turn them into a normal drinker, right? Including methamphetamine. <laughs> it just doesn't work. It's true though, right? <laughs> like, like we, yeah. I've tried, right? We've tried all these methods, right? Yeah. We are in a room full of people who are like, maybe, maybe if I take this, I won't have consequences, right? Um, it's the pop that made me sick. It's this, it's this statement here where it says, the only relief we have to suggest is entire abstinence. That is a word that brings up all kinds of thoughts of no fun, right? <laughs> abstinence. Does anybody not know what abstinence means here? It means to abstain from something, right? To, to, to not do something. So if the solution to alcoholism, right? If the solution to all of the consequences and all of the drinking and all of the problems was to just not drink, the program of recovery would be this long because they've given us the solution to the allergy, right? So it's interesting that there's all kinds of more information coming. Because if we could just simply decide at this point to not pick up the first drink, right, that would be the end of the story. Just but, don't drink. But what's interesting is that that's what we hear commonly in the fellowship. And we've done that. But we forgot that we're not supposed to pick up that drink. How many people have forgot they're not supposed to drink here? And how many people remember after you take the drink? Oh, my God, I'm not supposed to be doing this. Your body says, damn right, you. <laughs> we got some shit to do tonight, man. <laughs> Anybody? Oh, just me. Yeah? Things are going to get real now. Watch this and hold my beer. Right? Okay. So clearly we haven't been given a whole scope of the problem yet. We've just been given one symptom of it, right? And what they're saying here is that the solution to this symptom is to abstain from drinking. 
But, <laughs> right? Yeah, somebody sent me something today. I'm not going to get into it. They know they get a response from me. They're like, they laughed when they send it to me. There's podcasts that people talk about situations that make them alcoholic. Right? You hear that? Anybody hear that? Situations, made my upbringing, trauma, all this, may, made you addicted to alcohol. Situations may have, like even drinking to it, may have made you addicted to it. Right, well, we'll get into later. So here they're saying, what causes alcoholism? The allergy. So what does alcohol actually do? Cause it or reveal it? It reveals that you have this. Big difference. Huge difference. Because there's a group of people over here who use alcohol as a medication, right? And then later on they get help and they can find some moral support, some counseling, they were the ones that the doctor talked about. Remember the doctor talked about very, very successful with these other people, but with people of your description, I haven't been successful at all. It looks like I've been successful. Things were looking good. And then you show up at your own party hammered. How many people hear people, I, I got loaded just before my cake? How many people, I just got loaded after my cake? How many of you, I was loaded during my cake? <laughs> Anyway, so so we see it reveals it. Then they talk about two examples here where they both became sold on the idea here. Right? You guys should have read this this week. That's part of your homework is to read this. We'll go through the highlights. Did you want to add anything on that? No, it's just it's an interesting point to leave the doctor's opinion and go into Bill's story, right? Like with the knowledge and understanding about the allergies, that it is physical, right? It's not something that's occurring prior to drinking. It's something that happens after drinking, right? Once alcohol is ingested, this is the symptom we're talking about, this, this phenomenon of craving, this thirstiness for the next drink, right? This inability to moderate the amount we take. Like how many people have you know, had a job they needed to go to the next day. And they've gone out for drinks with coworkers. And coworkers have been able to knock it off at three or four. And there you come in rolling, three if at all. Three or four in the morning or three or four drinks? Exactly, right? <laughs> Everybody else seems to be able to go out for a few drinks without suffering the consequences. They're doing it with impunity. And here you are rolling in, if at all, you know, late, and, you know, unable to carry out your duties the next day, even though this job is important, these tasks are important to you, they are not um, as paramount as this allergy is. They are not as powerful as this inability to control the amount we take once we get started. So when we go into Bill's story, it's important to see, right, here's the allergy at work, but then there's something else at work prior to taking that drink. So when the doctor kind of made that reference, Drinks with, they see others taken with impunity. These people don't want to drink. They see it's troublesome, but they find themselves drinking again. So that's the example. They keep doing it over and over till they can experience an entire psychic change. These specific types, right? So in Bill's story, as we go through it, what are we looking for? We're looking for the symptoms and the progression of alcoholism, yes? So as we read through a story, hopefully you read through it this week as part of your homework, right? We see how he tries to combat this thing because of his lack of understanding of it and how confusing it was. And then we see in the first time he ended up in treatment, which we'll go over, the second time he ended up in treatment, and what was the difference the third time he ended up in treatment. And that's the same sequence that has to happen within the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous if you're of this type. If you have benefit enough to come into our fellowship, hook up with somebody that take you through this, right? There's a big difference. But if you've come into this fellowship, you will see this type of thinking, right? That the doctor, their lives seem the only normal one. They're trying to figure out why they're doing what they're doing with their own thinking because they don't understand the illness. Does that kind of make sense? So when they talk about, as they we went through Bill's, story he, we see that his drinking takes on more serious right remember we he failed a law course and then the bullshit started happening right he was able to con his wife into believing that men are genius anybody ever get the story spin anybody spin a good story here right and, and, you know you're believing the shit. everybody around you is believing the shit. everything's good right and then uh, page three is, is taking on more serious proportions, which is really good. 
And then one, one of the things uh, um, he talks about here on four, you know, uh, the world's gone to shit in a handbasket. People are dr jumping from high finances. What did Bill do? He went back to the bar. Anybody have problems here? Life's falling down all around you, and you say, I'm going back to the bar. I'm going to go have another drink. Anybody? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> makes sense to me, right? I like uh, page five is uh, one of my favorites here because it says right at the top of the page, liquor ceased to be a luxury. It became a necessity. Down towards the end of the page, it says, I woke up. This had to be stopped. The last paragraph, shortly afterward, I came home drunk, right? Like you almost don't even need the rest of the story. It's yeah. like in point form, he, re he realizes that this is no longer something he's doing for fun. This is something he has to have. And then he gathers his resolve and says, this, this has to be stopped. This is a person that knows and understands that he cannot take so much as one drink. This is not a person who's trying to control and enjoy his drinking anymore. He knows he can't put alcohol into his body. And shortly thereafter, he comes home drunk anyway. And if you look at the setting all around him, like they lost the house, things are going to shit really bad. Right? He gets a deal together. Anybody remember? Like, your life's gone to shit. I got a job. That's important. I got a job. I got some money coming in. Things are looking good. You hear people that are new all the time. Sit up. I got to get a job. I got to get a girlfriend. I got to get a boyfriend. I got to get. As soon as I get, I'll be happy. Anybody have that mindset when they got here? I got to figure this out. I got to figure that out. This is just the resting place to figure things out. And that's what Bill's done. I figure out. I got a job. Everything's looking good. Then he gets drunk again. Anybody here? Everything's looking good, then you show up. Hi! <laughs> you look really high. Okay. <laughs> and then that's it. I woke up, this had to be stopped. Anybody? And then, so this is the mentality part. Their lives seem the only normal one. He, and he and Joanne mentioned that. He talks about here. I was through forever. I woke up, this had to, I saw I could not take so much as one drink. So he knows that when he drinks, something happens to him. That makes it virtually impossible for him to stop. How many people knew that here? I just thought I'd like to drink, right? I just thought I'd like to drink. And if I didn't get in trouble, that was a good night of drinking, right? And if I got in trouble, I, I drank too much. That was the indicator. Never mind tripping, banging my head, and crap in my pants. That was, you know, that's a bad night. <laughs> okay. At the bottom of the page, after all of those point forms we just kind of went through, what does he do? He says, renewing my resolve, which means I'm just going to renew the thing I did before and give that another try, right? Well, he doesn't even really say that, renewing my resolve, right? Like, this is, this is clearly a person who doesn't fully understand what he's up against. If he's completely and utterly willing to just apply what he did the last time he tried to stay sober, are we talking about somebody that understands their problem? No. I mean, it's really like trying to uh, loosen the same bolt with the same wrench that continues not to work, right? I'll just, I'll, I'll try again, just to see, and you so, know? And if you look at that kind of logic, and you sit in a meeting and listen, or if you listen to what you were saying in regards to this, you hear people say it all the time. As long as I go to meetings, as long as I read page 417. As long as I remain vigilant. My personal favorite is I wake up every morning and remind myself I'm an alcoholic and I can't drink. So does that sound like Bill here? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Because what's the basis of your sobriety? You. So you're not really dealing with an illness that has you. You're dealing with a behavioral problem. So I'll apply these things. I'll apply me to me to fix me. So what, what you're saying to us who have an ear for it is you don't understand alcoholism. So if you're in a meeting, our job is to educate you on what alcoholism is. First, it's to disturb you. Then it's to accost you in the parking lot That's with a big That's it. Book. Disturb. Because <laughs> if you see somebody who's dying, like Bill's dying of alcoholism, he don't really comprehend what he's up against because he's gotten used to the conditions. Right? So he's got some problems, but he's used to the kid. Everybody's looking at him going, holy shit. Let's take a look at what happens when he renews his resolve and tries again. Uh, some time passes, and confidence began to be replaced with cocksureness. I caught, I'm sorry, I could laugh at the gin mills. Now I had what it takes. So if you're in a meeting, this is what it sounds like. How many people have you heard say this? And it's not, they're new. 
They haven't done nothing really but go to meetings and surrender and read page 417 and remind themselves they're an alcohol. They're catch, they got catchphrase sobriety, bumper sticker sobriety. They're feeling better. And then they start to share and say, you know what? I don't even think about it anymore. The obsession has left. As soon as they say the obsession has left and they think they're, they're in a place of neutrality, what they just told you without realizing it, they don't understand alcoholism. And they're in deep shit. Let's find out what happens to Bill. One day I walked into a cafe to telephone, okay? Does he want a drink? Is he thinking about drinking? Does he walk into the cafe for the purpose of drinking? No, he wants to use a phone. And is his life going really good? Is he feeling good? The promises are coming true. Well, this is a guy that figures he can laugh at the gin mills, right? He's got it. Yeah, he's got what it takes. If he was sharing it to me, he'd sound pretty good, right? I got acceptance and uh, like life's fantastic. I went to meetings. I put away a chair at my home group this week. I'm doing service work. Here's, <laughs> oh here's, how, here's how fast it happens. But I'm sorry. You, interesting. Like this is how fast it happens. How much time does it take? It says in no time. In no time I was beating on the bar asking myself how it happened as the whiskey rose to my head, because now what's happening to him? The allergy, right? I told myself I would manage better next time. <laughs> but I might as well go ahead and get good and drunk. And then good, I did, good. right? You, you know what good and drunk means, eh? Huh? <laughs> You're talking to your feet left, right? Like, come on, you can look. Anyone ever talk to their feet here? Come on, you can do it. Come on. <laughs> That's good and drunk, eh? You got to concentrate on your foot where it's going. Here, here's, an, here's an interesting point of view that he starts to have. The remorse, horror, and hopelessness. How many people have experienced that? The remorse, horror, and hopelessness of the next morning are unforgettable. The courage, unforgettable. Right? This is the key word. Absolutely terrible hangover. Full of regret. Horrified at his behavior. Right? And he says it's unforgettable. The courage to do battle was not there. My brain raced uncontrollably, and there was a terrible sense of impending calamity. I hardly dared cross the street, lest I collapse and be run down by an early morning truck, for it was scarcely daylight. He's already made statements like, I I could see I could not take so much as one drink, right? This had to be stopped, right? We're not talking about somebody who's trying to figure out how to have a few and get away with it. We're talking about somebody who clearly understands that he cannot put a drink to his lips. And this is one of the founders of Alcoholics Anonymous, right? The first time he's trying to really get help is in 1929. 1929, you gotta look at that number. He's trying to change what he's doing because he's not digging what's happening in his life anymore. It's not funny anymore. Even he realizes that there's something seriously wrong here, yes? He's trying to create something different, but there's two things happening here. One, he doesn't have a solution to a problem he doesn't fully understand. He thinks self should be able to fix self. We hear that all the time. That's why we hand out chips and and we don't hand out plaques. Anybody ever sit in a meeting where they hand out chips and you hear a chip fall? Ding, 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 ding. That's how fast sobriety's lost. And every time you sit in a chair in a meeting, think about how many people sat in that chair before you thinking they'd be here forever. (coughs) Think about it. Who are no longer here. We're only 10% of the population that's had the opportunity to get help. When you think about that, where you're sitting, you only represent 10% of the people who are dying from this thing. And you're sitting with the opportunity to, to change your whole life that this thing was built on. Does Bill have that opportunity at this stage of the game? No. He'll continue to die of alcoholism, one of the founders. So you think one of the founders of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I think he was dabbling in the church and some stuff like that, so people were trying to help him. You think if there was another way of doing it, he would have found it by now, right? So now it's getting serious and he ends up in treatment. Oh, let's not forget that there's at least a half dozen people around Bill who are also scrambling, trying to find a solution for it because it's, he's, those people are not unaffected by this, right? Everybody. So I, just the end of this paragraph is, is interesting, right? Because at the top of the page, he's like, I had what it takes. I could laugh at the gin mills. And in a single paragraph, we go to, 
Um, I hardly dared cross the street lest I collapse and be run down by an early morning truck, for it was scarcely daylight. An all-night place supplied me with a dozen glasses of ale. My writhing nerves were stilled at last. A morning paper told me the market had gone to hell again. Well, so had I. The market would recover, but I wouldn't. That was a hard thought. Should I kill myself? No, not now. Then a mental fog settled down. Gin would fix that, so two bottles and oblivion. We, we've gone from a, a person who realizes he cannot take so much as one drink to a person who's not even trying now, right? He's given up. Like, this is not somebody who's making repeated attempts to stay sober and is still sort of in the fight. He's given up the fight, right? Does that make sense? We're in a very dark area where he's considering that perhaps maybe death might be the only way out. Because there's no hotline, you know, AA hotline. There's no treatment. There's nothing. But what's happening here is, is a bit of an intervention by the people around him, right? The people around him are saying, hey, you know, it's like anybody ever see a rehab commercial come on TV and everybody stops and looks at you in the room? <laughs> it's kind of, this is what's happening, right? The family, everybody's getting together and going... You know, there's like, hey, wait a minute, right? <laughs> so he talks about the, <laughs> my brother-in-law. My brother-in-law is a physician. Page and- seven. So we see the theme here. Here's the commercial, right? <laughs> okay. And through his kindness and that of my mother, I was placed in a nationally known hospital for the mental and physical rehabilitation for alcoholics. What visit is this then? We're going to count how many times he does this, right? So, so in, in contemporary or present day language, he's going to treatment, right? So which trip to treatment is this? Uh, and which is cool. Now watch the mentality that happens when he leaves. And this is like us. I got my chip. I just done treatment. I'm feeling good about me. Right, I got me all over me, and me's doing great. Can I share? Yes, we're just hoping you would. <laughs> Go ahead. So this is for the, uh, the treatment of mental and physical rehabilitation of alcoholics. Under the so-called belladonna treatment, belladonna is a natural but very powerful sedative, my treatment, my brain cleared. Hydrotherapy and mild exercise helped much. These are things that are offered in treatment centers still to this day, right? Like I went to treatment, got a gym membership. Right. Uh, Best of all, I met a kind doctor who explained that though certainly selfish and foolish, I had been seriously ill bodily and mentally. So the doctor's explaining his condition to him. Remember where he talked about full flight from reality and downright mental defectives? He's dealing with people like us. This doctor's explaining his condition to him. Get it? Right? And then he says their their alcoholic life seemed the only normal. They can't tell the truth from the false. So he's hearing the doctor tell him about his situation. He's putting it through the cheese factory. He's, he's calling his intellect. And, and we'll see what he comes up with as a result of the information that's being given to him. It's pretty wild because that's what we do. We don't hear what's actually being said. We interpret what's being said. We process it where we become, become comfortable with. And then we, he's going to tell you the results of it. So if you're working with somebody new, what I like to do is... Like, what, Joanna? So what, what did you hear me say? Oh, I'm going to be okay. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> no. <laughs> he we, got, let's go over it we, again. We had that conversation. <laughs> yeah. Let's go over it again. Do you hear what I'm saying? I, I, yeah, and I said, I said to you, I'm here, so I'm okay. And he responded by asking me what, what difference a, a parking lot made. Like, what difference does it make what fucking building you're standing in? You still have untreated alcoholism. A drink is still inevitable, nice. right? It re- I, I didn't like what I heard, right? It relieved That's me. That's good sponsorship. Yes, it was. It relieved me somewhat <laughs> to learn that in alcoholics, the will is amazingly weakened when it comes to combating liquor. It, it is, it almost, there's a little bit of information in step one that is almost comforting, right? If you've done step one accurately, you're not feeling very comfortable at the end of it. But to finally learn about this allergy, right, that this the inability to control the amount we take, you know, um, that the actual disease is not necessarily within our power or control. They haven't explained why yet. But from the doctor's point of view to Bill, for the first time, he's starting to learn from a medical point of view that all of the solutions he's tried to put in to play are not working because he's a terrible person. They're not working because he's an alcoholic. Right? 
So you've got a condition that you can't stop from happening. Right? This is repeated over and over. Right? That's what he's being told. This will continue to happen. Right? And you have this condition of the body. Right? Let's see how he feels about that. Let's see how he interprets that. My incredible behavior in the face of a desire to stop was explained. Understanding myself now. <laughs> <laughs> I got acceptance. I got acceptance about my situation. Right? It's about just surrendering to that idea and having acceptance about We're the only group of people that think that works. Well, because we're, we're really the only group of people that as soon as we hear something that makes us feel comfortable, we stop listening past that point, right? Like, oh, my feelings about this have shifted. I'm, I'm fine. This is the solution. The key now fits in the lock. I know everything I need to know. No, no. I don't want to know anymore. <laughs> this is it. Because right? I feel good now about the fact that I know now. I don't want to have any more conversations. Acceptance what? and surrender is good. So we go from remorse, horror, and hopelessness to I fared for, forth in high hope. For three or four months, the goose hung high. Oh, <laughs> getting more chips. Shit's good. This is incredibly familiar, right? It's different this time. Yeah, this is incredibly familiar. I got enough information that made me feel better, so now all I'm going to do is hang out at meetings and hang out with other sober people, and, and, and everything's going to be great, right? I take a four-month chip. Uh, I went to town regularly. I'm sponsoring people. I get a job, <laughs> right? I'm making a little money. Yep. Surely this is the answer. What's the answer? self-knowledge and how many people hear that when we tell people brand new people just read 417 just remind yourself every day meeting makers make it so you're starting to feel good about something you don't know you have you feel a lot of hope yeah i'll just go to meetings i just don't drink no matter what i won't drink no matter what meeting makers make it right or maybe I'll ask for help in the morning, give thanks at night. If I see there's a problem, then I might apply the steps to it, but I need to do the steps first, so I don't really see there's that much of a problem to really get carried away with doing the steps. Is there a 12 and 12 round I could get involved in? <laughs> right, 12 and 12 is a comfortable place to be, right, because it doesn't explain this stuff. It the explains just enough to make somebody feel comfortable about where they're at when they should be anything but comfortable. Right? Which is why we talk about disturbing people and it, it's not something we necessarily enjoy to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mitch, speak for yourself. <laughs> so, so. But it's a necessary part of carrying the message, right? Like if, if somebody uh, really understands the problem, if they are sufficiently educated about the symptoms of alcoholism, it's not leaving you with a very warm and fuzzy feeling. So right? ha has Bill from what we understand, has Bill done step one? No. Does he believe he has a problem? Yes. Does he believe he has a problem he can take care of? Yes. yes. Right? Okay. So see that thinking? So can you talk to him about anything else now? If you try to give him a different understanding than the one he's having, would he listen to you? No. That's like being in a meeting. Why would I listen to that big book thumper, talk about that stuff, right? When there's somebody here with a problem I could listen to to feel better about my sobriety. Mm -hmm. That's why we like... Listen to new people, if you're untreated, I like to listen to somebody worse off than me so I can leave feeling better that I'm not them. <laughs> this problem-oriented meeting. Anybody? Leave the meeting like, you can't see that you're in deep shit. Can he see he's in deep shit? So it's going to take something to get his attention again, right? But it was not. For the frightful day came when I drank once more. The curve of my declining moral and bodily health fell off like a ski jump. After a time, I returned to the hospital. What's the, what number of treatment are we on now? Is this the same hospital? Yes. With the same people? Mm -hmm. Surrounded by the same supportive community? Mm -hmm. With the same doctor, right? Yes. But look at his condition now. Is he happy-go-lucky he was the first time? Surely this is the answer, self-knowledge. Well... I find this part actually interesting. Uh, you know, like the, the, first, the first visit, the doctor is talking to Bill about his problem, and on the second visit, he's not even talking to Bill. He's talking to his wife, right? <laughs> the curve of my declining moral, moral and because bodily health... Because something not right with us. ...fell off like a ski jump. After a time, I returned to the hospital. This was the finish, the curtain, it seemed to me. My weary and despairing wife was informed that it would all end with heart failure. So does he have the gift of desperation here? So let's see if that changes, right? Because we hear all these things. You hear these well-known speakers, I got the gift of desperation, so? Let's see what that does for Bill. And then the other one is, I surrendered, right? And then the other one's acceptance. 
and willing to go to any lengths, right? Those are the key things for sobriety, yes? We hear that all the time, come on. Well, let's see if Bill's the, one of the founders of Alcoholics Anonymous, yes? He's in second time in treatment. He means it this time. Last time he was a little confused, but this time he means it. Okay, go ahead. Uh, she would soon she would soon have to give me over to the undertaker of the asylum. They did not need to tell me. I knew and almost welcomed the idea. It was a devastating blow to my pride. I, who had thought so well of myself and my abilities of my capacity to surmount obstacles. How many of you in this room come from what you would consider a bit of a rough upbringing? How many of you have some tremendous problem solving skills as a result of that <laughs> rough upbringing? How many of you are like able to get yourself out of like such complicated jams? Even you were impressed on the other side of it. Like we are not the type of people who can't solve problems. We do it almost professionally at an Olympic level on a daily basis. Where the people other people call when they have a problem. <laughs> so, you know, we're, are we relating to Bill's, you know, response to his own alcoholism? Like, I don't have anything in common with Bill. I didn't have an affluent upbringing. I'm not a middle-aged white guy. I don't work for the, you know, I'm not a stockbroker. Right? I don't have any of those qualifications. So if somebody told me to just go through this chapter and find myself in it, I'd be like, I don't know what you're talking about. But when we break it down like this, right? when we, when we do it the way Tony explained at the beginning, where we're looking for the symptoms of alcoholism, right? we can start to see and relate to how, um, how Bill responds to his own disease. And it's very familiar. It's more familiar than some of us care to admit. Now I was to plunge into the dark, joining that endless procession of sots who had gone on before. I thought of my poor wife. There had been much happiness after all. So he's all. hit bottom, right? He's, would you say he's hit bottom too? So he has all the stuff that we hear about meetings is a prerequisite to getting sober, yes? It's talking here about loneliness and despair and a bitter morass of self-pity. Quicksand stretched all around me. I had met my match. I had been overwhelmed. Alcohol was my master. So he has acceptance to the idea. He surrendered to it, yes? Alcohol is my master, yes? So he should have the elements of changing his life now, right? But there's something missing. And a lot of people come into our fellowship the same way. They think those are the prerequisites of getting this. Unless this, this third thing element happens, we'll continue to experience Bill's story. That's what the doctor's getting. See, this is happening over and over and over. And it's getting worse, getting worse, getting worse, right? Okay. Um, fear sobered him for a bit. Then came the in insidious insanity of that first drink. And on our Mistus Day, 1934, I was off again. So, er oh, sorry. Yeah. So, what's keeping him sober now? No, he, he used a specific fear. word. Fear. fear. And then he got loaded again. Now he's using specific language. Why did he get loaded again? Because the obsession came back? The insidious insanity. Right? He knows that there's something happening in his mind that he can't combat. And when it happens, there's nothing he can do about it. He's understanding the first conversation the doctor had, had with him. He's understanding now. He's like, oh my God, I have this condition. I'm hooped. So, what's, so he has step one, but what's missing from his life? A solution sufficient enough to bring about the change that the doctor talked about was a psychic change, an entire psychic change. Until this happens, is Bill's story going to change? It's going to continue to spiral. He's going to get sober for a bit, and then somewhere along the line, he's going to get loaded again. And then he's going to get sober for a bit, and then he's going to get loaded. That's the story of alcoholism. And it doesn't, it doesn't care how he feels. Right? <laughs> So basically, he needs witness protection from himself, doesn't he? But it's not coming yet. <laughs> okay. Um, he says at the bottom of the page that his musing was interrupted by the telephone. The cheery voice of an old school friend asked if he might come over. He was sober. Like, it's, it's in italics, almost like in some sort of, like, expression of disgust. Right? <laughs> It was years since I could remember his coming to New York in that condition. I was amazed. Rumor had it that he had been committed for alcoholic insanity. I wondered how he had escaped. 
<laughs> of course, he would have dinner, and then I could drink openly with him. Like, is Bill concerned about his friend's sobriety at all? No, he's already planning getting him loaded, right? Unmindful of his welfare, I thought only of recapturing the spirit of other days. There was that time we had chartered an airplane to complete a jag. His coming was an oasis in a dreary desert of futility. The very thing, an oasis. Drinkers are like that. It says, the door opened and he stood there, fresh-skinned and glowing. There was something about his eyes. He was inexplicably different. What had happened? I pushed a drink across the table. He refused it. Disappointed but curious, I wondered what had gone, gotten into the fellow. He wasn't himself. Come, what's all this about, he queried. He looked straight at me, simply but smilingly. He said, I've got religion. I was aghast. <laughs> Damn! <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure that's not the expletive he was thinking. So that was it. Last summer, an alcoholic crackpot. Now I suspected a little cracked about religion. <clears throat> He had that starry-eyed look. Yes, that old boy was on fire, all right, but bless his heart, let him rant. Besides, my gin would last longer than his preaching. So what's interesting, so when we read through this, we see Ebby starts talking about his experience. He didn't know around. Ebby's talking about his experience and how he came to sit in that chair across from Bill, how some people approached him, carried a message to him, he applied it to his life. There was a change sufficient enough where he called Bill. Remember that? It's Bill didn't call him, he called Bill. It's interesting he uses that specific language. He had come to pass his experience along to me. Did this friend get on a train and come to Brooklyn and come to Bill's kitchen to tell him what it is that he should and shouldn't do? No. No, no it's a very different conversation, right? He's not sitting across the table saying, you need to do this and you need to do that. He's saying, this is my experience. Maybe it's of interest to you, maybe it's not. But how I just want to pass he, it on to you. How long was he sober for? Two months, something changed. So in, later when we read the spiritual appendix, they talk about through this course of action that they present through the rest of the book that we're going to get into in a minute, is that through the application, what usually takes place in a few months, not by the time you get to step 10, but it usually takes place in a few, few months through the application of all these principles in the pursuit of this thing, this change happens where the people around you are more in tune to it than you are. What we try to do is convince the people around us how much we change. Yes? <laughs> the, the, right? These people around him are starting to see a change in him, which is really cool. On the next page, he talks about he talked for hours. So they're, they're sitting in a conversation for hours. Abby's talking about his experience. This is important. He's talking about his experience. Right? And Bill's thinking... Right, he's still plagued with his own thinking. He's thinking for two solid pages, right? Ebby's sitting across the table from him, sharing his experience with him, and what's Bill doing? Thinking. He's thinking about his childhood. He's thinking about all, all of his objections to religion. He's thinking about his, his, you know, his uh, objections to anything to do with God or something more powerful than him. So, like, we're talking, and some of you are thinking, right? And you're not even drinking, supposedly. Right? <laughs> so hopefully. Right? <laughs> Bill's sitting there drinking. Right? And he's, his buddy says one thing and then he goes thinking again. Oh, I'll be back in a second. I got to go confirm with my buddies upstairs here. He goes back to consult with them. He's having a whole conversation with himself. Anybody? Oh, yeah. This guy's trying to share his experience and get him to participate in the saving of his life. Bill says, I'll be back in a minute. I got to finish a thought here. Right? Hours, right? But even Bill recognizes it over on page 12. He says, despite the living example of my friend, right? This, a, a living example of sobriety, you know, after being locked up for alcoholic insanity. I, I just want to, one, yeah. one thing. So what, what happens here is so important that Ebby's talking about his experience with this power. Yes? Bill can't dispute it. He's sitting across the table from him. So what Ebby's doing, what we understand, is Ebby's 12-stepping Bill. But what he's representing with Bill is because Bill understands step one now, right? Mm -hmm. Ebby's talking, Bill's understanding it as step two. Step two, from Bill's point of view, is the course of action that Ebby took, right? Ebby's talking from the place of experience. Bill hasn't had that experience yet. So he's understanding this thing that's being presented to him as the solution to the problem, which is step two. 
But Ebby's talking about from a place of having had an experience with it, which is step 12. Does that kind of make sense? Mm -hmm. And what he did was talked about the course of action that he went through to have this experience, yes? So at the bottom of page 11, which is, which is really, really, that floored me, where there's a shift in his thinking. They talk, it came to believe that a power grand cells could restore us to sanity. Bills has this shift because he's plagued with his own thinking previous to this conversation, which we would call a 12-step call, right? And talking for hours. Bill's plagued with his own thinking, right? How well do you think Bill would have done before what we're going to read here with his own thinking in regards to what Ebby was talking about? Not very well because he couldn't get past his own thinking. Anybody here? Right? So he has to understand what Ebby's talking about before he could kind of conform his own idea, his own game plan, right? His own conception. Here we go. Despite the living example of my friend, there remained in me the vestiges of my old prejudice. The word God still aroused a certain antipathy when the thought oh, was sorry. expressed. So back here, page 11. Where that floored me. So he's talking. He, that floored me. It began to look as though religious people were right after all. Here was something at work in a human heart which had done the impossible. My ideas about miracles were drastically revised right then. Never mind the musty past. Here sat a miracle directly across the kitchen table. He shouted great tidings. So we're the first example. It's not just talking about this thing. We're an example of what's available here for those who have yet to experience it. There's no better story than our story Right, representing what's available here in the miracle of Alcoholics Anonymous. You guys are saying you were like me, and you're now like that? How did you get like that? Because I, he's saying, I knew you. Look at you. Right, big difference, right? So that became the best thing when we say me too. We started that, that movement a long time ago. I did that, me too. Yeah, I tripped, banged my head, shit myself. Yeah, me too. <laughs> right? We were at a meeting one day where everybody started going, yeah, me too. <laughs> me too. <laughs> it was a couple of all on people. was like, yeah, I know. And then moving on. The point I wanted to get to, the point I wanted to get to about the, the living example sort of sitting across and, and, and Bill still, right, arguing inside of his own head. And his friend suggested to him, why don't you choose your own conception of God? And later on down it says, it was only a matter of being willing to believe in a power greater than myself. Nothing more was required of me to make my beginning. And, and because the previous paragraph and the thing to understand is Alcoholics Anonymous doesn't exist yet. The 12 steps don't exist yet, right? We're, we're relating it to our contemporary experience and present day terms, right? This is 12 step to Bill's step one to the solution in step two. But these terms and understandings don't exist yet. Ebby is a member of the Oxford group, right? He's been through a religious uh, program. And, and how he gets through to Bill is by setting all of that aside and saying, why don't you choose your own conception of God? I'm not here to force a religious idea down your throat. I'm here to offer you a solution, right? And it's more important that you be willing to believe in this solution that it is for you to define what, what it is I'm talking about. Does that make sense? Because he talks about that early, he calls it all different things. It's not the calling, it's not the naming of it, it's the exercise. It's coming up with your own conception. What was the conception being presented was a course of action, right? Come up with your own conception. What does this mean? What is your own conception? The formulating and devising of a plan. That's what conception means. I, I like your, the way that you explain it in simple terms. It's like, I need to get somewhere. And somebody rolls up in a vehicle and says, get in. We're going. And we want to stand there and argue about the make, model, and color of the car. <laughs> right? It's, it's, and what Ebby is saying to Bill is, never mind the make, model, and color. Right? Just get in, <laughs> right? And, but, it's the conception that's important here, right? What does that mean, conception? Is the formulating of the possibility of the idea I could have the same experience too if I just did what you did. And sidestepping all the, those thinking, all my teaching, everything that I've ever learned. And that's the conclusion he comes to by choosing his own conception is how can I make this palatable that I could start doing what you're suggesting. Is it possible for me to have this thing? 
And so that's what he talks about here. That statement hit me hard. It melted the icy intellectual mountains in whose shadow I lived and shivered many years. I stood in the sunlight. It was only a matter of being willing to believe in a power greater than myself. Nothing more was required of me to make my beginning. I saw that growth could start from that point. Step two it was presented to him. He sees it's possible that he could have this thing. Right? Upon a foundation of complete willingness, I might build what I saw in my friend. Does he have what he, his friend has? He saw he could build what he saw in his friend. So he's changed his conception to a point to pursue what's being offered. That's what they mean. Choose your own conception where it's palatable enough that you could pursue the solution that's being offered to you. Right? Would Bill been able to be in this position before his conversation with his friend? So that's why it's so important he understood what his friend was talking about. He also understood what, was, what he's seen, and he's seen it was possible. So without his friend presenting the conception or this idea or the demonstration of this thing, Bill would have never been able to pursue it. So he sees it's possible that he might have what his friend has, yes? Mm -hmm. So he's actually done step three, yes? Yeah. So what confirms step three is he goes back to the hospital for the third time. Right? And the third time, he acquired certain ideas that the doctor talked about. Where did he acquire these ideas from? His friend. His friend in the kitchen table. His friend talked about his experience and how he acquired this thing. So now, his friend, Ebby, is the difference the third time in treatment. He's going to walk him through the same course of action that he was walked through. Right? And what's the confirmation of the change? Right, because we're getting to that time with the confirmation of that change. He started having his own experience with this power. Right? You don't want to read it? <clears throat> oh, Bill, you guys are supposed to read it, right? So he, he goes through the course of action. He was to check his newfound thinking with the new God consciousness within. So he moved from the cheese factory into the consciousness, the life force that we'll get into later, this thing in here that's always talked to us. Now he's in counsel with something greater than himself. He's not in counsel with himself. Remember the earlier pages? Who was he in counsel with? A lot of problems. Now he's in counsel with something else. And what confirms he's in counsel with something else is he's now in communication with it and he's comfortable with the idea that this thing is taking place. He was common sense would become uncommon sense. And then his friend promised when these things were done, what things? The things that he presented, the things that we presented, we promised when these things were done, we'll, ha ent we'll have a, enter, a what does that say? Right at the bottom. My, my friend emphasized the absolute necessity, no, nope. where am I going? Page 13, right at the bottom. Right at the bottom of 13. My friend promised when these things were done, I would enter upon a new relationship with my creator that I would have the elements of a way of living which answered all my problems. Belief in the power of God, plus enough willingness, honesty, and humility to establish and maintain the new order of things were the essential requirements. So, his, so we see he's in stage two recovery now. He's in counsel with something other than him that creates the change sufficient enough for him to have a different experience. Before, he was always in stage one recovery, trying to create this change based on him and the things that happened within his own mind. Before what, though? Before the psychic change or spiritual experience, Like, right? it's important at this point to say that belief in the power of God plus enough willingness, honesty, and humility to establish and maintain the new order of things for the essential requirements is not the total, you know, that, that's an interesting principle in theory, Right? but not necessarily something that you can practice without all of the paragraphs that preceded that, right? Like he goes into the hospital, he acquaints his friends with his deficiencies, right? He makes them known, right? He, uh, I admitted for the first time that of myself, I was nothing. Um, his schoolmate visited him, acquainted him with problems and deficiencies, made a list of people he had hurt and toward whom he had felt resentment, expressed an entire willingness to approach these individuals admitting my wrong. And then he starts to experience this change, right? Never was I to be critical of them. I was able to write such matters to my utmost of ability. I was to test my thinking by the new God consciousness within. What Does step that, would that be? That God consciousness doesn't come without that process, right? If, if you try to apply it without the process, 
you're just trying to apply principles and morals without having an experience with them. So that would be step 10. <laughs> oh, sorry. Did I say that out loud? <laughs> well, it is really. I have a problem. Uh, my solution is spiritual. So I'm just going to run around apologizing to people and being more aware of myself. Right. And when I think there's a problem, then I'll yeah. seek help. Steps one, two, little bit of three and ten. Right. That was why everybody's shaking their head. I don't know why you're shaking their head. I'm not getting involved. <laughs> okay, so the homework this week is see, there's two things that confirm the change that happened in Bill's life. And they're on page 14. And the element. What, what is the recipe that needs to be maintained? And how, what confirms the two things that confirm this thing has actually happened in Bill's life? He'll talk about that and then see how, what he was like afterwards. So we've seen the third time in treatment was his introduction to this course of action that he engaged in that created this change. And then now we're gonna see what his life is like afterwards through applying these principles. Make sense? We have a seventh tradition. We're self-supporting through our own contribution. We don't pass it around. We leave it up here. We're, we're responsible for our own stuff. The money that's put in the basket goes to help pay for the rent and the books and the worksheets um, for the workshop. So if you're able to contribute, great. If you're not able to contribute, that's fine. It's certainly not a requirement. And seeing we're at the beginning of the workshop, we'll close with the serenity prayer, not to freak anybody out. What's the basis for a good life? God, God. Grant, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Live long and prosperous. May the force be with you.